The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, what hillbilly elegy got wrong about Appalachia, plus the myths and realities about the New Deal and its lessons for the Green New Deal. And Congressman Al Green joins Bill Press to talk about his call for Donald Trump's impeachment. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. The conservative story about the New Deal is that it was tax-and-spend liberalism at its worst. Lewis Hyman reminds us that isn't how it worked, and the real story has valuable lessons for the Green New Deal. And we say hello to Lewis Hyman, historian of work and business at the ILR School of Cornell University, where he also directs the Institute for Workplace Studies in New York City. He is the author of several books. His most recent is Temp, How American Work, American Business, and the American Dream became temporary. Lewis Hyman, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. A real pleasure. Thanks for having me. And our pleasure to have you with us. Now, Lewis, you recently wrote an article for The Atlantic titled The Green New Deal, It Wasn't What You Think. One of the points you make is that we too often think about the New Deal as primarily a government tax and spend project. So what's left out of that story? Well, it is a story, and it's a story we're told in our high schools, in our colleges, about the government spending a lot of taxpayer money on transforming the economy. And parts of it are true, but what's important to realize about that story is how much is left out, that the parts of the New Deal that had the biggest impact, that created suburbia, that created and electrified the countryside, that created the aerospace and electronics industries. These were all done by private capital. This was not done through taxpayer funds. And the government acted as a middleman through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to create systems of insurance and lending that channeled the idle capital of Wall Street, where it was sitting during the 1930s, channeled that money into these technologically cutting-edge projects, creating millions of jobs, creating millions of homes. And I wrote the story because it's important that we recognize all the options that we have. And if we're going to solve climate change, we're going to need a lot of money to do it. And I didn't want uh, people to be hemmed in by the story they had in their heads about the New Deal, because what was really successful about the New Deal was its finance. Now, there's a very important player in this story, Jesse Jones. Who was he? Jesse Jones is an iconic Texan businessman, and he is a publisher. He is an oil investor. He is a real estate developer. And most importantly, he is a banker. And during the Hoover administration, right before FDR, he was brought in as part of this Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which at the time under Hoover, who is more conservative than FDR, just wanted to, you know, recapitalize local banks that had been failing. Well, in comes FDR, who promotes Jesse Jones, who's a Democrat from Houston, and he is much more expansive in his ambitions. He thinks that the scared money of banking is why we are in the Great Depression. And so he sets up systems to channel capital uh, into investment. And as a real businessman, uh, he thinks about capital, not just, you know, making everything balanced, because capitalism is about growth, Texas is about growth, and Jesse Jones certainly is about growth. And you write that it was very important for Jones to deal with a business that was risk-averse in the wake of the Depression. How difficult was that task? Well, he, you know, bankers were terrified. He wrote later that they thought 
that they had to wait until, quote, the, the dark skies had cleared. But he knew that, you know, the economies weren't natural. Economies didn't just, they weren't like the sky. They didn't clear by themselves. They had to be fixed. And so because he was an entrepreneur, um, he was comfortable with risk. He had been taking risks his whole life and been successful with them. And so one of the things he did was to create systems that reduced the risk of investment so that banks with money just sitting there not making a return, he created ways for them to lend their money out safely without risking their money and getting a small return in exchange for that. And that is what made possible the main programs of the New Deal. We're speaking to Lewis Hyman, historian of work and business at the ILRL, ILR School of Cornell University, where he also directs the Institute for Workplace Studies in New York City. Uh, one of the major achievements, Lewis, of this time period was making mortgages safe again. How did the Roosevelt administration accomplish that? Well, the Roosevelt administration, in conjunction with Jesse Jones, in conjunction with, with what is today Citibank, designed some systems so that the mortgages would no longer be driven by very short time horizons and into long-term stable investments. And so in the 1920s, during this sort of speculative run-up to the 19, to the Great Depression, houses had very short mortgages. They were three to five years. They were balloon mortgages so that you just refinance them every few years. And what this meant was that after the crash of 29, that it was very hard to get those mortgages refinanced. And so the mortgages, you know, people bank, went bankrupt all over. They um, went for, for foreclosed on. And this is what led to the housing crisis of the early 1930s, after 32. So when those first mortgages came due. And so what the Federal Housing Administration did was it created a system for long-term mortgages, 10, 15 years. It created a system of standard rules for houses that could receive these mortgages. And in doing so, and the system, most importantly, of insurance, so that if a lender lent money on a mortgage and there was a default, then they could get back their principal. They wouldn't get back their interest, but they'd get back their principal and that would be paid out over a number of years through a set of bonds. So this allowed people in New York City to lend money to home builders in Texas that they had never seen. They knew that it followed; these houses would follow the FHA guidelines. They knew that they would get their money back. And this is just an astounding intervention in, in terms of the flow of capital around the country so that suddenly people far away from Eastern banks had access to mortgage capital. And this is just sort of the first pass of this system through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and it sets the stage for other kinds of interventions in the economy. And you also write about the Rural Electrification Administration. Why is that an important part of this story? It's a crucial part. So at the beginning of the 30s, about 10% of rural America had electricity. And we often hear about the TVA, the Tennessee Valley uh, Authority, which created electrical power for the Tennessee Valley. But that's only a small part of rural America. The rest of America was still dark. And if you are trying to get your economy going again, you want people in rural America to buy those new electrical goods that you're making in your urban factories. Well, they can't do that without electricity. And the REA was important um, in doing this. What it did was it did for rural electrification what the FHA did for housing. So the government, again, acted as a middleman taking capital from Wall Street and investing it, but this time in local cooperatives that were organized by communities to run electrical grids. And the big electrical companies thought that it couldn't be done. It couldn't be done at a reasonable price, and they didn't want to string those cables into the country. But, you know, local cooperatives did it, and they got the financing through the REA, and they paid back their debts. In fact, the REA was profitable. Um, for the government. So this is an important story about how to upgrade infrastructure uh, through cooperatives and through finance. You know, and it's interesting as, as, as we're talking here and, and the parallels 
to where we are today and what a lot of people are calling for and what a lot of people want to have happen, and it's that infrastructure, infrastructure. And the point of your article is that the, the people organizing on the Green New Deal should learn something from this history. So what's the lesson? The lesson here is that there are lots of opportunities to get around this denouncement of the New Deal. There's lots of opportunities to finance green initiatives, whether that is, you know, green housing or whether that's, you know, digital infrastructure or whether that's funding new kinds of industries like carbon recapture or batteries or, you know, I'm not an industrialist, but the sort of whatever that next stage of technology is can be funded through these kinds of systems that we pioneered in the 30s and set the stage for the success of the entire post-war economy. And right now, by thinking that we just have to spend money, we're shooting ourselves in the foot because it's very hard to get bipartisan support for that. It's very hard to get support from business. And these parts of the New Deal were very supported by business, very supported by Republicans, and were very supported by the American people. It really transformed urban and rural America. And if we're trying to think about how to bring people into the economy that have been left out, these kinds of projects are just wonderful examples to think about how to upgrade our infrastructure and at the same time, take all that currently idle money on Wall Street, which is about two and a half trillion dollars, and really put it to some good use. Well, and of course, the Green New Deal is already and has been uh, getting slammed with the socialist label. Um, is there time to change that perception and, and convince industry giants that this can actually be in their interest? Well, this is this is why I wrote the piece. I hopefully it's it's becoming part of the conversation how we can make capitalism work better and for everybody, which is what we did in the post-war, and trying to figure out how to get that idle capital um, back in motion, trying to get it back in circulation. And that's not socialism. That's just smart capitalism. And when this was done in the 30s, it was done by business leaders. It was done by the people who ran railroads and department stores and you know, the, our biggest concerns and, you know, automobile industries, the company, automobile companies. So there's a way to bring business on board. Business gets that the foundation of capitalism is investment and it's investment in our future. And they just want to know how to do that and make a buck while doing it. And we can, we did it before and we can do it again. Absolutely. Lewis Hyman, historian of work and business at the ILRR School of Cornell University, also directs the Institute for Workplace Studies in New York City, and the author of several books, including his most recent, Temp, How American Work, American Business, and the American Dream Became Temporary. Lewis, as always, pleasure talking with you today. We look forward to having you back again with us soon. Anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee.
This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, Appalachian Reckoning, a region responds to hillbilly elegy. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. MAGA blusters Donald Trump, make America great again. America's ranching families, however, would like Trump to come off his high horse and get serious about a more modest goal, namely, make America cool again. Cool stands for country of origin labeling, a straightforward law simply requiring that agribusiness giants put labels on packages of steak, pork chops, etc., to tell us whether the meat came from the USA, China, Brazil, or where in the world to stand. This useful information empowers consumers to decide where their family's food dollars go. But multinational powerhouses like Tyson Foods and Cargill don't want you and me making such decisions. So, in 2012, the meat monopolist got the World Trade Organization to decree that our nation's cool law violated global trade rules, and our corporate submissive Congress creditors meekly repealed the law. Then came Donald Trump, and his Made in America campaign, promising struggling ranchers that he had restored the cool label as a centerpiece of his new NAFTA deal. Ranching families cheered, because getting that American-made brand on their products would mean more sales and better prices. But wait, Trump has now issued his new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, and where's the beef? In his grandiose 1,809-page document, cool is not even mentioned. Worse, his deal slaps America's hard-hit ranching families in the face, for it allows multinational meat packers to keep shipping foreign beef into the U.S. market that does not meet our food safety standards. Aside from the yuck factor and health issues, this gives Tyson and other giants an incentive to abandon U.S. ranchers entirely. This is Jim Hightower saying, to stand with the ranchers, contact National Farmers Union, nfu.org. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. The book Hillbilly Elegy became a literary phenomenon that many relied on to understand the white working class voters who helped elect Donald Trump. Anthony Harkins says Hillbilly Elegy reinforces simplistic stereotypes that can be used for political gain. And his newest book is a powerful response. And we say hello to Anthony Harkins, professor of history at Western Kentucky University, the author of Hillbilly, A Cultural History of an American Icon, and co-editor most recently, along with Meredith McCarroll, of Appalachian Reckoning, A Region Responds to Hillbilly Elegy. Tony Harkins, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Oh, delighted to be here. And our pleasure to have you with us. Why did you feel this book needed to be written? Well, I think uh, the you know it, it is both a reaction to the sort of phenomenon of, of J.D. Vance's hillbilly elegy and its uh, enormous popularity, but also to the widespread opposition or concerns about that book and the ways it was being uh, used, um, both uh, both in literary terms and also politically, to advance a a limited vision of the Appalachian experience. What is your understanding of the popularity of hillbilly elegy? Well, I mean, I think it is, uh, it is a, you know, it is a, a powerful story of, uh, of rising above many difficulties of the sort of hardships that many people um, in the broader Appalachian region and in the Rust Belt experience, and, and frankly, really across the country, um, it is uh, very much of a kind of Horatio Alger story of pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps and rising and uh, overcoming the odds through luck and pluck. <laughs> and uh, that's a very 
positive story that a lot of Americans, um, you know, like to hear. They want to believe that people can rise and fall through their own individual efforts, that, um, that, uh, <clears throat> that you can tell that story and, uh, still be, can still be true in modern America. I think the other thing is that his, the fact that he had risen to the state that he had gave him in some sense the credentials, oddly, to speak for uh, the region. The fact that he went to Yale and that he had worked for Peter Thiel at the sort of highest levels of economic and educational achievement meant to many um, critics, you know, literary critics and political pundits that he therefore was someone who could be trusted in terms of the, the story that he tells. Um, in some ways, in other words, the distance that he has moved from where he started was what gave him the credibility to be seen as the the, the voice of of, uh, of the region. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I do not in any way question his right to tell his story. Um, and uh, you know, rather remarkable story. But when he uses as a subtitle uh, a memoir of a family and a culture in crisis, then he's sort of conflating his story with uh, a much broader one, and that and that really distorts in many ways the truth of the the diversity and the and the and the range of experiences of, of Appalachians. Well, and as you have noted, Hillbilly Elegy presents a stereotype of Appalachians as mired in poverty and despair. So how does this stereotype hurt Appalachia? Well, it's not, it's clearly not the first time that's been done. Um, as I trace in my earlier book, Hillbilly, um, there's a long history of conceptualizing the region as one of of people who sort of can't take care of themselves, who... Um, who either are too isolated from the broader economic uh, world to be successful or more recently who are too dependent upon government programs and, and outsiders to be successful. And I think what it, what it reinforces is the idea that the region is a something that can be a place that can be ignored as it often is, or b in this, in those, in the, small windows of time when it's paid attention to, uh, as it is now, it can be seen as a place where, you know, the people have kind of brought on their problems on themselves because they're not creative enough or, um, or, uh, hardworking enough to, to rise above. And it erases many of the larger economic, uh, systemic economic and uh, political forces that maintain inequality in the region. We're speaking with Tony Harkins, professor of history at Western Kentucky University, author of Hillbilly, a cultural history of an American icon and co-editor with Meredith McCarroll of Appalachian Reckoning, Appalachian Reckoning, excuse me, a region response to Hillbilly Elegy. There's a remarkable story that you tell in the introduction of your book, Tony. At, at an Appalachian Studies conference in 2018, a group of young people literally turned their backs to author J.D. Vance and began to sing, Which Side Are You On? What is the significance of this story to what at least some Appalachians want us to know? Well, I, I, was, uh, I was at that meeting, and it was, uh, it was quite a remarkable thing, and it shows you the, uh, the intensity of, of, uh, of opposition to J.D. Vance's story in terms of presenting that as the only story of Appalachia. Um, people were very upset that it was reinforcing negative stereotypes. It was uh, presenting the Appalachian story in very narrow terms as basically only a white working class male, um, and that it was uh, demeaning to many of the people of the region and the way he talked about uh, both his family members and people outside of his family, uh, the, the sort of uh, loose way he uses terms like hillbilly without much uh, exploration. And of course, Which Side Are You On is a song from Appalachia. It was uh, It was written at the time of the mine wars in the 1930s and and framed as a as a kind of defense of the people against the powerful interests and so using that song i think was was rather brilliant actually in terms of framing 
this uh, this experience in that way. On the other hand, it was a complicated time um, experience for me as well because uh, the people who had invited J.D. Vance to Appalachian Studies are some of them are also contributors in the book, and the people who are participating in the protest are contributors in the book. Um, some of them, and so uh, it it pointed out the ways I think we've tried successfully, hopefully, to incorporate multiple voices uh, in in the book in Appalachian Reckoning to say that no single voice is the is the voice of Appalachia, that there are many experiences. Some uh, writings in the book uh, find positive things in J.D. Vance's story, either either in exposing what they say are hard truths that we have to face about the region or the possibilities of moving beyond very difficult circumstances to, to rise up. And then other voices, other contributors in the book are very critical of J.D. Vance and the way he uses, um, the way he uses his story to, to hide or distort uh, the broad range of stories that Appalachia has by race, by class, by sexual orientation, etc. Um, so it was a moment where it showed the intensity of feeling, but I hope it also opens up a, a space for dialogue and discussion and, and candor about the region and about what it is to be Appalachian. And as you're talking about it, all I can think about is that that has to be a healthy situation when you have people from both sides and, and there's a discussion going on, a little protesting going on or whatever, but everybody gets to be heard. And I, I just overall, I just I think that's a very healthy thing for everybody in this country. And it could be used in a lot of other places as well. Um, I, I thought it was, too. And, and uh, you know, for I thought it was healthy for the organization, which um, can be a little high bound and tied to the past and, and, and it showed the, the vitality and the dynamism of younger people uh, becoming active, uh, but doing it on their own terms. You know, they're not simply going to follow the orders of their elders. Sure. And now tell us about how you went about uh, compiling the material and your choice to include such a wide variety in, in format that includes poetry and photography as well as essays. Well, I think Appalachian Studies as a as a discipline has always been very interdisciplinary, has always been interested in combining um, artists and scholars and activists. And, um, <clears throat> and so we wanted the book to represent that as well. And uh, the book is born out of a panel that I that I um, moderated and led. Uh, two years ago at the Appalachian Studies Conference, and a number of the contributors come from that panel. And then I wanted to have a range of, uh, Meredith and I, as we talked it over, wanted to have a range of voices of, uh, by gender, by age, by region, by um, occupation, by uh, race, sexual orientation. So we wanted to include all of that, and, and, and the photography came rather late, but I think it was a, a wonderful addition because part of the goal of that, as well as the poetry, was to to help people outside the region recognize its complexity, the depth of, of the you know the the thinking and the artistry that's that's being produced here, and to challenge the stereotypes of people who are uh, you know sort of depressed and and broken down and, and incapable of of sort of functioning on their own. Several of your writers in the book challenge the dominant view of Appalachia as exclusively white. What do they want us to understand? They want us to understand that Appalachia has always been a multiracial uh, space, um, you know, starting with Native Americans, of course. Uh, but then in the 19th and 20th century, there were large numbers of African Americans who, who came to the region uh, following the coal jobs. There were lots of people from Eastern Europe and other parts of the world who came as well. It was one of the most diverse places in America um, and and remains so in some ways. And it has some major cities in it as well as uh, rural spaces. Appalachia often gets de defined in very narrow terms as exclusively white, exclusively coal miners, when in fact that's a, a tiny, tiny percentage now of the, of the workforce. Um, exclusively male in many ways, 
and very conservative uh, in terms of socially and politically conservative. And although those things are there and those things are true, it also has um, a lot more diversity than, than that. And and the African American voice is important to recognize that it's always been part of the of the mountain experience, and so it was important to include those contributors. And you also included several community activists in the book. Why is it important to recognize the tradition of activism in Appalachia? Uh, again, I think because it's framed oftentimes in the public media as a space of of non activism, of passiveness of sort of allowing the problems of the world to roll over them without any response. And um, um, people who are, you know, too incapable of leaving and making a better life. Um, And we wanted to stress, as has always been true in that in history, that it's always been a place of activism, a place of struggle, a place of people working to, with, with relatively few resources to improve their lives and make a better world. Um, and, um, and that continues today. Now, this is not a political book, but the role of Appalachia in politics certainly looms large, especially during election years. What do you hope politicians can learn from this book? Uh, well, I, you know, I'd be a little reluctant to, to be giving lessons to politicians, but I think one thing is that Appalachia often gets framed as mono. Uh, monopolitical, like it, like it all votes in one block. And one of our contributors, Dwight Billings, has coined this term Trumpalachia as a kind of construction of the idea that the entire Appalachian region voted for President Trump and sort of in lockstep, uh, neglecting the, the understanding that in the primaries, at least, um, Bernie Sanders did very well. He out, out pulled uh, Hillary Clinton in it. 2016 primaries in a number of places that Appalachia has a history of political uh, radicalism as well as um, as well as uh, moderation. I mean, there's 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 I guess the main lesson is to not take Appalachia for granted, not to assume that everyone in the region votes the same way, not to assume that the results of the 2016 election are the only imaginable results. Um, a number of the contributors in the book that I've spoken to have said, you know, the, the the outcome had as much to do with who didn't vote as who did vote. And um, as a region that is often ignored and and uh, isolated in the national media, there seems, uh, among many, little reason to vote that the two parties are not going to be much different for them. But that doesn't mean that um, that they all are exclusively going to vote always for, you know, Donald Trump or for for any single party or, or politician. Mm-hmm. Stay away from the stereotypes, people. <laughs> Stay away from the stereotypes. Anthony absolutely. Harkins. I mean, not just in Appalachia, but everywhere, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Anthony Harkins, professor of history at Western Kentucky University, author of Hillbilly, A Cultural History of an American Icon, and co-author or co-editor with Meredith McCarroll of Appalachian Reckoning, A Region Responds to Hillbilly Elegy. Tony, thank you so much for your time with us today on the America's Democrats podcast. We'd love to have you back again with us soon. Oh, it was a great pleasure. Thank you very much. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Representative Al Green from Texas tells Bill Press about why he believes there is a moral imperative to impeach Donald Trump. Congressman uh, Al Green, uh, known, among other things, for being the first one to introduce uh, impeachment, uh, articles of impeachment against the President of the United States, Mr. Congressman, it's always good to see you. It's an honor to be with you. Oh, uh, it you. really is. You have been a champion for 
uh, people uh, since I have known of you, and uh, I salute you for your many years of service to people. Thank well, we you. thank you, and we're still going strong. And, and uh, in fact, we announced this morning we're going off and uh, taking the show to a whole new level with a new podcast, which we're launching the first week of June, where we're going to be taking a particular look at the right in the middle of the 2020 presidential contest. Before we move on, Congressman, let me, we just want to take a minute to check on some of the comments from our listeners and viewers over the last half hour, Peter. Yes, indeed. A lot of comments uh, on, let's start with 2020, where our, our buddy Phil here in Washington, D.C. says, nobody in New York City wants de Blasio to run for president. He see, seems to be running for his own fortune and vaingloriousness. That says something. Uh, Annette brings up a good point when we're talking about polls and a lot of the polling. She asks, uh, should we be talking more about polls? Does anybody under the age of 70 answer the phone if they don't recognize <laughs> the number? That's a very good point because a lot of these polls That's a say, real weakness like, with these polls. Exactly. No, oh, it's, yeah. they're very, very unpredictable. I, uh, and by the way, if you look at your phone, you know, where, where uh, what, do they, what do they call that, calling, you know, Caller ID. Caller ID, yeah. right? Yeah. And it says survey? You sure as hell don't answer, yeah, right? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We also talked about the uh, abortion uh, law in Alabama. KG says the men and women of Alabama have to step up on their own and elect the right people. We can't do it for them. This will be more true uh, if Roe versus Wade goes to the states. Uh, if you have a comment on any topic at any time, find us on Twitter at BP Show, at BP Show. You know, and on that point, Congressman, it was 25 white men I heard in, the, in the Alabama State Senate who passed this bill, which is, let's face it, is going to impact especially poor women, African-American women, people of color, right? Yes, it's just, I, I heard this on the news and I was quite disappointed uh, there was one senator who did uh, ex- emotionally express his outrage and uh, thought that he uh, raised some important points. I they don't make exceptions for rape or incest. No. Uh, it just seems to be something that uh, they want to get before the court. This is done purely to get it before the court so that they can mm-hmm. overturn Roe, uh, which uh, is settled law and which would probably create quite a bit of consternation among voting population, especially women. Uh, it, it's so extreme, pardon me, so extreme that even uh, the Reverend Pat Robertson, <laughs> no, uh, no crazy liberal he, right, uh, said this goes to, here, here's Pat Robertson yesterday. I think Alabama has gone too far. They've passed a law that would give a 99-year prison sentence to people who could commit abortion. There's no exception for rape or incest. Uh, it's an extreme law, and they want to challenge Roe versus Wade, but my humble view is that this is not the case we want to bring to the Supreme Court because I think this one will lose. Yeah. When when Pat Robertson says you've gone too far. I, I think that he may be right, but um, given the makeup of the court, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about that. Uh, I think that um, with Kavanaugh, uh, who was, uh, mm-hmm. at, to say the very least, ambivalent in terms of how he expressed himself, uh, I think that um, we should be concerned, and I think we have to take every opportunity to make it known that this is unacceptable. Uh, for 25 men, and then all of them to be of one hue, I think that that speaks volumes about the mindset that this uh, Senate has when you will allow this kind of thing to occur. This is a very, very sensitive issue, uh, Mr. Press. Uh, this is the kind of thing that people have to grapple with, and it tears at their souls. Uh, we assume too many of us, and not I'm not including myself, but uh, too many people assume that uh, this is just done arbitrarily and capriciously all the time, yeah, that, yeah. that women don't they, don't, they don't torture themselves and families don't go through a crisis when this occurs. Uh, this is the kind of thing that family members have to resolve, and as best as they can, they have to come to terms with. Uh, so I'm going to leave this in the hands of people who have to grapple with these issues and the people that they trust to confer with, not the government. Uh, there are some things that the government ought not do, and extending its hand into the womb is one of those things. Uh, well said, uh, Congressman. Uh, now, I want to ask you about a story the Washington Post uh, that reports this morning, uh, that yesterday there was a caucus of House Democrats and Speaker Pelosi, this is reported by the Washington Post, I wasn't there, that the Speaker Pelosi 
uh, encourage the members to stick to their policy agenda in 2020 and not to go down the road of starting impeachment hearings. Uh, she said that before, but the Post says that she made this pitch again yesterday in the Democratic caucus. And according to the Washington Post, not one single Democrat stood up to challenge her. Uh, can you confirm that? And why didn't you or anybody else stand up? Well, thank you. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to respond. Um, yesterday was a day that I gave a floor speech. Uh, and so I was not there at the time this was said, if mm -hmm. it was said, because yeah. I can't okay. validate it. Okay. Uh, anything that I would say would be hearsay. Got it. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. I, I can't validate Fair it. Fair point. Yeah. But, but I may say, if I may say this, Please. Uh, my views are fairly well known. So <laughs> 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 right. I, I don't think it's a secret. I think most people uh, who have been engaged in the process are very much aware that I'm antithetical to what this president has done, and I believe impeachment is a remedy. Do you believe that the president has committed impeachable offenses? Oh, absolutely. Which ones? Or uh, absolutely. That, how would you well, uh, let me identify give you, them? Uh, quickly, I'll give you a broad summary. Uh, the Mueller report, I think, uh, speaks volumes about obstruction. Uh, if you recall, I indicated when he fired Mr. Comey that uh, the president just can't fire a person because he doesn't want to be investigated. Uh, that, that's beyond the pale and I thought at that time we should uh, look at impeachment uh, because once you see the president cross the line and you don't step up and challenge him, he sees that there are no guardrails. And then he has continued, and Mr. Mueller has given us some 10 to 12 different reasons. But Mr. Cohen, um, uh, 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 the, the president's special lawyer, personal lawyer, um, he um, uh, said that um, the president uh, engaged in a process with him that, uh, quite frankly, has caused him to go to jail. Yeah, and, he's uh, in jail now. Uh, yes. Uh, and if the president is an unindicted co-conspirator of a sort, I think that merits some uh, review as well. And uh, I would say this, uh, bigotry in policy. Uh, when you say that there are S-hole countries in Africa and then you roll out your immigration policy as it relates to Africa, uh, when you say that there are some very fine people among the bigots and racists in Charlottesville where a woman lost her life, uh, these are the kinds of things that say to me that you're unfit to be president. As a matter of fact, Mr. Press, uh, this president is in office probably for one reason more than any other. He is a beneficial bigot. There are people who are benefiting from his bigotry. Good example, uh, a good man members of the religious community. Mm. Um, they, they have just, in a sense, sold their souls to this president. Things that they would not tolerate in any other person on the planet, they tolerate because he is a beneficial bigot. Uh, they understand that he's a bigot, but he's their bigot. And as long as he's their bigot and he's doing uh, some of their bidding, uh, they seem to find favor with this. I do not. I think that the president has brought us to the precipice of a constitutional crisis. Now, there are people who would differ, but let's remember this. There is no hard and fast definition of what a constitutional crisis is. So if you hear someone say, here's what it is, that's his or her opinion. Mm -hmm. Everybody can have an opinion on it. Here's my opinion. If we conclude that a constitutional crisis will only occur when you get to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court can't resolve an issue, as is the case between the House now, uh, and the executive, the president, and everyone is expecting this to go to the Supreme Court and eventually with the subpoenas, the Supreme Court will rule. And then if the president won't abide by the ruling, if that is a constitutional crisis for you, then I would differ with you. That's a constitutional collapse. Hmm. You see, mm -hmm. I make a distinction between a collapse and the know. crisis. The crisis is the thing that we're in now. If we get to a point where the president just absolutely refuses to honor a court order, then that's a collapse. And I think that we shouldn't allow ourselves to get to this point. The solution is impeachment. It is perspicuously clear. The Constitution speaks to it. And we ought to go down that road because if we do, Mr. Press, we don't have to worry about Supreme Court ruling. John Roberts will rule because he presides over the trial. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. trial will take place in public view. Every ruling that he makes will be seen by the public. And then we will have the opportunity to not only see the rulings made, but also to see them implemented and to see how the president responds. Now, there are two arguments that the speaker and others make 
against moving forward with articles of impeachment. One is that uh, Democrats promised we, we get control of the House and we've, we've got a public policy agenda to, let's say, save Obamacare, do something about prescription drugs, do something about climate change, about jobs, about minimum wage. And if you start impeachment hearings, it's going to detract from or make it maybe make it impossible to proceed with the policy agenda. What's your response? Well, I don't think that's the case. Uh, if you feel here Democrats speaking, they're saying that we're adhering to the policy agenda and that we can walk and chew gum at the same time as a phrase that's commonly utilized. I, I concur with that phraseology. But I would also say this. There are some things, Mr. Press, that— You, you could call me Bill. <laughs> I, I, I respect I, you greatly, and I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to just be in your company. There, there are some things, sir, that um, are bigger than the people themselves who have the duty and responsibility to negotiate them. Uh, when you have a president who is absolutely defying— all of the constitutional norms as they relate to the Congress. Send out a letter saying that, just forget about it. Uh, we're not going to cooperate with you. Uh, that's the essence of it. Uh, y- you have a serious problem. And here is the problem. The problem is we now have a crisis as it relates to the balance of power, the checks and balances that we expect to maintain that balance of power, literally, literally. The, ch- the well, system itself now is mm-hmm. at risk. And if Congress does <laughs> not impeach, if Congress does not impeach a president who is absolutely defiant, Nixon was impeached for failure to honor subpoenas. But a, and a defiant, and th- by the way, this is many, many times worse, but a con- president who's so defiant, if we do not, what we will do is say there are no guardrails. There, there, is, there are no boundaries for this president. And given his behavior thus far, uh, only um, the mind of uh, a, a great uh, writer such as Dante can imagine the destruction that he could cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, I cannot imagine what he can do. So we have Good. no choice now but to impeach. And uh, we've had this choice for some time. And I say no choice. We still have so, a choice. But I think impeachment is a solution. Oh, so another argument is, against your point of view, is, OK, these are serious issues uh, that we have um, now with uh, Congressman Maxine Waters at uh, f- f- banks and financial institutions. Deutsche or Bank. Yeah, um, with Adam Schiff, with intelligence, uh, Jerry Nadler, with uh, judiciary. Let's let these committees do their work first and see if they lead us into impeachment here, rather than that impeachment would be the cart before the horse. Not at all. Um, let's let's. Look and I at hope this. you appreciate. It. I'm, no, no, no. These I, arguments I, that I've heard, and I, I want to get your response. I want yeah. your. I want the toughest questions you have. Okay, <laughs> so please do not back yeah. off one one scintilla. Let Let me make this comment first. If we don't impeach, here's what the president will say: The Mueller report vindicated me. There was no collusion, and not only was there no collusion, uh, there was no obstruction. Because were there obstruction, the Congress of the United States, dominated by Uh, Democrats would have impeached me. They did not impeach me. Therefore, the Congress itself has vindicated me by their inaction. Uh, That is not something I would want said of the Congress of the United States of America, given the Mueller report. For those who've reviewed it, it's it's absolutely shocking. For those who have not, you should so that you can be properly shocked. Uh, Now, Mm -hmm. to to deal with uh, what you've just said, um, Mr. Press, um, we have a constitutional responsibility to put the moral imperative to maintain the uh, co-equal branches of the government, the House being one of them, a part of it, the legislative branch. We have a moral imperative that trumps political expediency, no pun intended. Um, uh, Political expediency is not something that we can allow to stand between us and the moral imperative to protect the House of Representatives, part of the legislative branch, as a co-equal branch of government. We will become a toothless paper tiger if we don't take action, given that we all say now, um, most of the members of the House that I've heard talk about this, that the president has committed impeachable offenses. How can we say 
that he's committed impeachable offenses and then say uh, impeachment may not be the thing to do. I, I just don't see how we can do it. At least one person will not allow this to happen, and that will be me. Mr. Press, I have said before, and I'll say again, uh, if the House, by and through various committees, won't take the appropriate action, the Constitution and the rules allow each member to bring impeachment to a vote. Uh, I have done it twice before, and I have no reservations about doing it again because it's the country that's at risk, but it's the soul of the House that is going to be lost. Uh, and the final argument that I hear is that that if, if it were the House to begin impeachment hearings, it's exactly what Donald Trump wants because <laughs> he would then say, look, I'm a victim of these yes. Democrats. They're just of course picking on me. Of course he would. And uh, now first it was Mueller and now it's, you know, N- Nancy Pelosi would. and the rest. And, uh, and his base will rally behind him and that it could help him politically and hurt Democrats politically. Is there a you single, worried about that? Is there a single person who uh, views politics in a serious way who doesn't believe that his base will rally around him regardless? <clears throat> I, mean, I, don't, I don't think he has to do very much to have a base rally around him. He has already indicated he I could think that's around. a given. Yeah, so yeah. that's going to happen. That's going to happen, notwithstanding anything else. Uh, but here is the, the point uh, with reference to that. The president doesn't want to be impeached. Most would-be authoritarians, uh, would-be dictators, if most of these people with this mentality want to be loved. This is why when you go into countries where there are dictators, they have their pictures up and people have to march and dance and sing and praise. And the best example of how this president um, is a would-be, not there yet, but he's a would-be authoritarian, uh, is the way the people in his cabinet have to literally praise him at the genesis of a cabinet meeting. He goes around the room, thank God for, for uh, General Mattis, who, yeah, who, right. who said, you know, the troops are doing great, Mr. President, and we're going to be ready. Uh, not those exact words, but others just fell in line. It's amazing to me how people have just lost and surrendered their integrity to this man simply because he's a beneficial bigot. He's beneficial. He benefits them. Uh, There are people in this country, Mr. Press, who have staked their reputations on fighting bigotry. There are organizations in this country who have at the very core of their constitutions to the the challenge of taking on bigots wherever they are. Uh, And they do it Mm -hmm. religiously and righteously, except when it comes to the president. They have sold themselves out because they will not take on this president. Uh, We have seen him in the international arena, how his bigotry, how he's been able to weaponize it to the extent that he can show people how they can benefit from it. And that makes him a person who is truly persona non grata. We have a duty, a responsibility, and an obligation in this House to impeach this president. We don't have to have the hearings. I'm I'm not opposed to them doing it, but I don't want us to get into the paralysis of analysis, as Dr. King put it. Uh, We don't want to just talk about this until at some point we'll say, oh, it's too late now. Let's just wait until the election and defeat him as opposed to impeach him. So you're telling us today that you are still determined, prepared, ready to call for a vote on impeachment at any time. I won't say at any time. I think okay. that there's an asset test for when it should take place that I've not revealed to anyone. Uh-huh. But I do think that, yes, uh, I, as, uh, as God is my witness, uh, I, I will do it if no one else does, if the proper committees don't do it. Absolutely. We have to go and- on record. The people who look through the vista of time have got to know where each of us stood at this time of crisis in the history of our country. And if people... Uh- out around the country uh, who are joining us today, uh, either right now live, television, radio, later on in the podcast, want to help, right, and kind of help you put some pressure on some people, how do they do so? What do you, well, what do you want them to do? What do you, well, uh, what would you ask you, people glad to glad do? Glad you mentioned the people because about 45% now say that they'd mm-hmm. like to see impeachment. And, uh, of course, overwhelming majority of uh, Democrats would like to see impeachment. Here's what I say to people. I have told members, and I say it now, vote your conscience. 
I'm, this is a, a matter of conscience for me. So I say, vote your conscience. And I tell the people around the country, uh, you know what activism is. You do what you think is uh, appropriate for the circumstances. I don't tell people how to go about expressing themselves, but I do think that every person has a right to weigh in on this question. And make their voices known, right? I, however they choose to. Right. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about something else while you're here. Yes, sir. Uh, and that is uh, about a big Senate race in Texas coming up. Yes. Next year, yes. right? Yes. John Cornyn is up. Yes. Right? Um, do we have a chance of getting that seat back? Um, do you think that Julian Castro should be running for that seat instead of running for president? And why aren't you running? Well, you're very kind to think as highly of me as you do. If well, you, if, you, if, you, if you, you're you're as high a profile well, as anybody else you, in Texas. You're, you're, you're the first person to, to say such a thing to me. I'm honored that you would. Uh, I'm trying as best as I can to f fulfill my constitutional responsibilities in the House of Representatives. Now, the follow-up question is, is that a no? Uh, that is a no. Okay, so now let's You're talk. You're not going to run. I'm not okay. running for Senate. Uh, I'm running for the House of Representatives. Uh, I have been there, and I enjoy the work that I do. I think it's a good thing for me to do. But in terms of other people, I, I'm not the person who's going to select who the challenger ought to be. There are persons who have indicated they are interested in this. Um, Mr. Castro's brother has indicated that he's interested mm -hmm. in this. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chris Bell, former Congressman Chris Bell, has indicated in the Houston Chronicle just yesterday, I believe, that he is interested in running. So we have plenty of candidates, a plethora of persons who may want to run. Uh, I will be supporting the Democrat. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the Democratic Party will have a good uh, opportunity in Texas, a great opportunity to turn Texas blue. I, I really believe that there are enough people in Texas now who've seen enough of this president who will be driven to the polls, notwithstanding the fact that his people are going to show up, but they'll be driven to the polls uh, such that uh, we can turn Texas blue. I think this is a great opportunity, and my suspicion is that we will have a uh, Democratic senator from the state of Texas. So Cornyn, you believe, is vulnerable Right. And beatable. Well, here's what I believe. I believe that the president is going to bring out a wave of persons who are going mm. to vote for Democrats. Mm. Now, Texas has done something mm. that's uh, a little under the radar that you may not be aware of. Uh, and prior to this election coming up in Texas, we could vote by pressing the Democratic button and yeah. you would vote for all Democrats. They've eliminated party voting. You now will have to go down the line and vote for yeah. each person. On a typical ballot in Harris County, that can be as many as 80 to 100 people. Oh, wow. Yeah. To that vote could for. impact it as yes, well. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, indeed. Sir. Congressman, it's always good to see you. Well, Thank it's an you. honor. Thank you. You, are, you, you You just never stop. You never slow down. You're really right well, out I'm, the front. Well, I'm, on I'm headed to issues. the floor of the House this morning to give another message on impeachment. All right. Okay. Well, so, thanks for stopping here first. It's always good to see you. Congressman Al Green. That's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Lewis Hyman, Anthony Harkins, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.